Okay, our next speaker is Elaine E, and she'll be giving the talk titled Learning the Statistics of Pronoun Reference by Word or by Category. Um, thank you. So hi, I'm Elaine, and thanks for being here. So today I'll be talking about language adaptation in relation to pronoun comprehension. Um, in data communication, we interact with um, lots of different people, and we have such an adaptive language system that allows us to quickly get used to others' um, speech styles, including their use of words, phrases, and sentences. And what's more important is that such learning occurs um, through exposure, and people are sensitive to, to these um, linguistic inputs in their environment. Um, in language comprehension, adaptation occurs when people are getting used to these linguistic inputs in their um, language context, and as a result, they become faster at processing these frequent structures, and therefore, um, and also, they're more likely to um, adopt these um, frequent structures when they interpret some ambiguous um, inputs. Um, so it's well established that comprehenders adapt to a lot of um, statistical regularities at multiple levels of language. So for example, at the syllabic level, infants learn about these artificial syllable sequences and use them for future speech segmentation. At the lexical level, um, we know that high frequency words in a language are usually recognized and processed more quickly if they are um, than um, low frequency words. Um, at the syntactic level, some, um, the processing of some difficult structures can be facilitated through um, repeated exposure to some similar structures. So we come to this question about whether people adapt to these course level structures. Um, so uh, when we think about pronoun comprehension, we usually encounter this um, ambiguity issue about who the pronoun refers to. So for example, if we are given a sentence like, Anna cleaned the house with Liz, she used the bloom. Um, it's kind of ambiguous here, the pronoun can refer to either Anna or Liz because they are both female. So how do people resolve this ambiguity? Um, we have this hypothesis um, that they can learn about some referential patterns through their prior language experience. So um, as syntactic rules are quite critical to our um, pronoun comprehension, we are, uh, we are wondering if people frequently encounter pronouns that refer to the subject, will they be more likely to adopt a subject interpretation when they encounter some ambiguous um, pronouns? To the opposite, if they encounter pronouns that always refer to the non-subject, will they be more likely to adopt non-subject interpretation instead? So in our current study, we um, specifically examine this type, um, what we call referential adaptation, in which case people um, keep track of the frequencies of this type um, of referential patterns, and they use them for future pronoun comprehension. And in this case, a referential structure can be recognized as a subject pronoun link or a non-subject pronoun link. There are a few differences among these um, different levels of language ad um, adaptation. So for example, um, the syllabic and lexical inputs are usually small and explicit linguistic units. And the syntactic adaptation can involve um, a larger unit of language. Um, there are sometimes long distance dependencies like causes, sentences, and they require very abstract representations about these um, syntactic structures. Similarly, um, referential adaptation um, usually involves long distance dependencies about the implicit referential link between the pronoun and their antecedents, and they also require very abstract representations about um, this information. But what makes it really different from the other levels is its complexity of the structure categorization, and we, and we will talk more about this later. So there are um, some several uh, previous studies, including Kaiser 2009, um, providing evidence that people are able to represent these abstract relations between pronouns and antecedents. So for example, in, in Kaiser's um, study, they gave participants priming sentence like um, this two. So, uh, half of the participants receive sentences that have a subject pronoun link, while the other half receive um, sentences with a non-subject pronoun link. And then participants were tested on this ambig ambiguous um, pronouns. Um, just to know that um, these verbs were made up to be nonsense in order to avoid the um, potential confounding effects for the um, verb semantics. And in the results, they found that people um, did indeed immediately follow this exposure pattern, 
uh, when they um, interpreted these ambiguous pronouns. Um, however, this, uh, this effect of exposure was found to be pretty small in these previous studies. And in order to elicit a stronger effect of exposure, Johnson and Arnold 2022 developed a um, referential adaptation paradigm in which um, half of the participants receive sentences that include pronouns that refer to the subject, and the other half receive sentences that including um, pronouns refer to the noun subject. And for each referential pattern, participants receive a consecutive series of exposure um, items in order to establish a strong learning of the patterns. And then they were tested on ambiguous pronouns. By this, uh, by this design, they did establish a strong, uh, a robust effect of exposure. So in the results um, showing this graph, we can see participants tended to um, give a high proportional of subject responses when they were given a subject reference pattern. Um, to the opposite, if they receive non-subject response, uh, non-subject re reference pattern, they are more likely to give um, non-subject responses according to, um, corresponding to a lot fewer subject responses in this case. So now we have clear evidence for uh, referential adaptation. Now we have more open questions about like how exactly people adapt, adapt to these structures and how do they categorize these different um, um, referential structures. This question has actually been partially answered in their um, study. So they have tested whether a referential structure can be defined by any referring forms. So for example, um, like names like Anna and Linda, and they also tested first and second pronouns like I and you, and also third person pronouns like he and she. And they found people only adapt to structures um, containing third person pronouns. Um, however, even within this class of third person pronouns, we can still have um, different representations like we can have he and she pronouns categorized by gender, um, or they can simply be distinguished as two different less cool items. So this raises one of the, our questions in our current study about how broadly people um, represent this class of um, different pronouns. So um, our first question was tested in experiment one. Does referential adaptation involve narrow or broad categorization of pronouns? And as we mentioned previously, a referential structure can consist of um, the pronoun and its antecedent. So we also tested the category of antecedents. So in experiment two and three, we ask whether referential adaptation involve um, narrow or broad categorization of antecedents. So let's focus on experiment one first. We just talked about that we can have he and she pronouns within this class of third person pronouns. So it is hypothesis. Um, if people make a narrow categorization of pronouns, they should be able to represent the he and she pronouns separately, um, in which case their adaptation to structures with a he pronoun will not influence their interpretations with, um, for structures with she pronouns. If they make a broad categorization instead, then their, uh, then their adaptation to structures with he pronouns should influence their understanding of structures with she pronouns because um, they are represented as a general class of these um, third person pronouns. A secondary question we ask is whether there is a match advantage by using the same pronouns and antecedents in referential adaptation. Um, this phenomenon might be comparable to the lexical boost effect, which was frequently found in syntactic ad adaptation, uh, which is that um, the adaptation becomes stronger when the words in exposure are repeated in the test items. And this suggests that the syntactic structures can be represented at a um, lexical level. So similarly, if there is a match advantage by using either um, the same pronouns or antecedents, then we will expect a stronger adaptation level when we use the same pronouns in test items compared to um, the exposure. Otherwise, the adaptation should be not that different for either using the same or different classes of pronouns and antecedents. Um, so to answer these questions, we use the referential adaptation paradigm um, developed by Johnson and Arnold. So, um, illustrating this diagram, this is the general structure of the experiment. So each single line represents um, a single item. And the blue items are the exposure items, and the other colors are the critical items. 
So here we um, manipulated the exposure such that half of the participants will receive um, exposure pattern that has pronouns always referred to subjects, and the other half receive ref referential patterns with um, pronouns always referring to the non-subject. And we also manipulated the critical items to make the pronouns in the test items either match or mismatch those in the exposure. Just to know that, we can see there is a series of consecutive uh, blue items here, uh, which we call the trending phase. Um, this is to establish a strong learning of the pattern, but um, participants will not be aware of any difference here. And our dependent measure is participants' um, pronoun interpretations, so we will use this uh, pronoun comprehension task. So for example, if participants were given a um, sentence like, Matt ordered pizza with well, he ate a pepperoni slice. Uh, they will be given two following questions, and particularly for the reference question which we are interested in, we always ask about the noun subject. So if here um, participants think, well, it's not well, it's actually Matt who ate a pepperoni slice, they have to give an answer no to indicate their subject interpretations. And we do this on purpose because um, in our previous studies, participants tended to show a yes bias in such judgment task. So we want to pull them away from the ceiling of always give a yes on responses. And also we have this quantum question to assess their engagement in the task. Here is one example in experiment one. So um, here we have these exposure items um, in which we use she pronouns for all of the exposure items. And then they were tested on ambiguous items which including both he and she pronouns. So if uh, we also have the opposite items where we use all he pronouns in the exposure, and in which case the she pronouns will be used as the uh, mismatching pronoun word. Um, from those results, we observe a robust effect of exposure. So here we can see a large difference between the blue bars and the, uh, and the orange bars, um, which shows a strong effect of um, exposure, meaning that participants are more likely to follow their um, exposure pattern when interpreting um, ambiguous pronouns. Um, additionally, we did not find any interaction um, of the match and exposure condition, in which case, um, so there is no match advantage by using the same pronoun words in exposure versus test items. Um, so we can conclude that participants are representing um, the he and she pronouns as the general class of third person pronouns. So they are not represented separately. Now we, turn, we can turn to experiment two and three about the categorization of antecedents. So um, one way to categorize the antecedents is by using, um, is by verb type and the semantic rows imparts to the antecedent. So for example, one of the verb constructions used in our test is the transfer verb. Here, the transfer verb handed identify the subject as the source and the non-subject as the goal character. And we can also, um, so this type of verbs is called source goal verbs uh, within this class of transfer verbs. And we can also have these goal source verbs in which um, the verb received identify the subject as the goal and the non-subject as the source. And we have another um, uh, verb predicate we call the direction predicates, in which this construction um, identifies the subject as the agent who performed uh, an action, and a commutative, commutative sorry, um, who helped the agent uh, perform the action. So here, um, so for the transfer verbs, um, evidence has shown that such, such type of verbs um, tended to elicit a um, bias towards the goal, which may sometimes interact with the subject bias toward the source. Um, and the direction construction usually elicits a subject bias um, towards the agent. So um, this is the general structure of our experiment two and three. So for the experiment two, we have all transfer verbs for our exposure items, which including both source goal and goal source verbs. And for experiment three, we have all direct action predicates for our exposure items. For test items, uh, for both experiments, we have um, test items to include both transfer verbs and direct action verbs in order to um, test whether adaptation to one verb construction can be uh, generalized across each other. Um, just to know that, for the test items, we have only the source code verbs, um, such as the one here, um, like lease, offer, the tickets um, to Anna, so the, the verb offered identifies Liz, who is the subject, as a source, and um, Anna, who is the non-subject, as the girl. 
And we did this because we found that the source culverts show the biggest um, this um, exposure effect in Johnson and Arnold's study. So in order to maximize our chance of observing the um, exposure effect, we use this source code uh, verbs in our test items only. So for experiment 23, we have this hypothesis about the categorization of antecedents. So if um, people are making a narrow categorization of antecedents, we will expect that um, their adaptation to structures with transfer verbs will not influence their understanding of structures um, of joint action verbs, because they are representing these antecedents by verb type separately. Otherwise, they were making a, a broad categorization, in which case their adaptation to structures with a transfer verb will, uh, will guide their interpretation of structures with joint action verbs and vice versa. Um, again, we use this paradigm just with some variations in number of items. Um, again, we manipulated the exposure item to make half of the participants receive um, the subject reference pattern and the other half receive the uh, non-subject exposure items. And as experiment two, we use all transfer verbs for the exposure items and the action verbs for the um, experiment three. For critical items, in this case, we manipulated the verb construction in the test items to either match or mismatch those in the exposure. Again, we have this training phase to establish a strong learning of the pattern. Um, this is an example in experiment two. So um, as we just said, we have uh, all of the exposure items to contain the transfer verbs. And in this case, the direct action verbs were used as the mismatching um, verb construction. Again, we observe a robust effect of exposure. So in here, we see this large difference between the blue bars and the orange bars in both the match and mismatch condition. And we also um, have this significant interaction of exposure and match condition, but we will talk more about this later when we turn to the final results. Now let's, uh, let's see the results from experiment three first. Uh, yeah, this difference. Um, so in experiment three, we now turn to use draw action verbs for all of our exposure items, in which case the transfer verbs were now used as the mismatching uh, verb construction. Again, um, the effect of exposure can be, seen, can be indicated by the large difference between um, the, the subject exposure and non-subject exposure bars in both the match and mismatch conditions. And also, again, we found this interaction between um, exposure and match condition. So combining the results from both experiments two and three, we can notice that um, the larger um, exposure effect was always uh, found for transfer verbs only, regardless of whether it's match or mismatch condition. So, um, so we speculate that it's because the transfer verbs have this higher sensitivity to interpretation biases. So there's no match advantage for using the same verb constructions. Um, to summarize, um, we have this strong replication of exposure effects across all of our experiments. So, uh, but what's more important is that, uh, first of all, in experiment one, we clarified that the, ad the adaptation to um, referential structures is specific to the class of third person pronouns, but not individual words like he and she. And also we did not find any evidence for the matching advantage of using the same pronouns. In experiments, um, in experiments two and three, we found this adaptation generalized across different an antecedents um, by determined by the verb types. And again, we did not find any ad um, direct evidence about the matching advantage of using the same verb constructions. Um, finally, I would like to thank my advisor, Jennifer Arnold, and all my prior colleagues and all the lab members who have contributed this, this, to this project. Thank you. Question. Hello. This is really cool. I was sort of curious if you've started looking at sort of the way that the, I don't know whether to call it priming or learning, is kind of unfolding across the experiment. Mm -hmm. So is the 
pattern you see on the very first ambiguous uh, case the same across all the subsequent places? Or does it kind of get even bigger as you continue to have the more exposures? Oh, you mean like trial by trial or yeah. cumulative across the experiment? Yeah. Um, we did not look at like the, the immediate priming, but we are looking at the cumulative effect of the priming. So we, say, we think it's adaptation effect because it's like um, going through across all, the whole experiment and shows this general tendency to have a higher proportion of um, responses corresponding to what they have been exposed to. Yeah. yeah, so I guess the question is, is the that pattern even bigger on the last ambiguous case as compared to the first one? Or yeah, is it kind um, of the same? Um, yeah, um, I think, um, so our calculation is based on like the whole average yeah. thing. So with, yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to look at. Yeah. And we, we did have a follow up experiment to try to think like uh, to contrast between the immediate priming and the cumulative adaptation effect. So I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, no, because it would be cool because then you can kind of distinguish like a priming thing versus like and what a learning thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This is a part of a, a larger project, and um, I think it's a super question, and I've wondered the same thing. I can't remember about this particular experiment if we, if we looked at it, but I have looked at it in many of our experiments, and the answer is no. There's no order effect, but that's because we always use this burst of training at the beginning, so it's really well established by the time um, we get to the beginning. Yeah. So it's a good question, but I think you'd have to um, do it without training. Um, I have two, I think they're kind of related questions, but with the stimuli, like when you're priming, or sorry, when you have like the exposure, like the first uh, sentence, there are two sentences, right? And then the test is an intracentential dependency, right? Where the pronoun is like, and he, blah. Um, so there's that, and also the fact that uh, I think with the, what is it, the, the transfer versus joint difference with the joint ones, I can see myself saying when they're when they have that interest intentional dependency, like I can use they as well, like Matt and John got a pizza and they like that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind versus like Matt and John got a pizza. They I don't know, like there kind of feels like a slight difference to me. Um, but I guess those two questions to say, have you thought about using other kinds of sentences or why did you choose those sentences in particular? Because I, I guess like there isn't like an exclusive pronoun that I would immediately go for in that case. Yeah, um, so we have this transfer construction and interaction constructions because they are the two verb types that so far we have known that they have a very obvious, um, uh, no, I mean, um, evidence showing that people display these kinds of bias in terms of these two constructions. So we can have that as the baseline and then we, we test whether the adaptation changed the baseline. So. Um, yeah, and I think it's true that for the interaction verbs, maybe some some there may be some interpretations about using they using plural pronouns. Um, so I use direction construction specifically with the singular pronouns he and she um, in terms of just to yeah um, I mean which which is a construction that has been frequently tested in previous studies. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is really exciting work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, this is super interesting. And I'm really excited to see kind of this like larger body of work building up to kind of look at these things very carefully. I was curious, um, actually some of the questions I had already came up before, so that's good. But I was wondering if you thought about the coherence relations between the, between the clauses, uh, you know, because I think most of yours were kind of like narrative, like this happened and then this happened, or maybe this happened and then there was a result. I was wondering if you had controlled or thought about was it explanations or result or parallel or things like yeah, that? Yeah, um, so I, um, if I remember, if I remember correctly, so we have a stimuli um, with a, so we, we have this contact sentence introducing the two characters. And then the following sentence is uh, begin with, and then, right? And then, so I think that's a like um, a, consequential probably coherence relation like 
like um, like what what they are doing immediately follow the previous sentence. So um, I think that's and we manipul we were trying to write the stimuli in a way that they are natural. Um, so people interpret it as a okay, they have this activity and then they are going to do something else. So okay. I think that should be controlling something. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of sounds like like, like it was kind of a narrative sequence type relation like uh, they did this and then they did this versus like you know john pushed peter and then he fell over where it's and yeah because the, i was thinking if you i don't think this is a problem i'm just curious because you yeah, have yeah. them match or, or like mismatch and that could strengthen or weaken the priming effect depending on if there's a match on the discourse coherence level between the mm. primes and targets too that might be something to think about i yeah i think so so um I'm not sure, but I, I agree um, that the cohere relations, cohere relations might play a role. Um, and if we use like other other sentences, like with a because clause, that might be different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank Very you. Oh, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. Can I ask you a question oh, yeah, quickly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is reading, right? Like they're they're reading these sentences. Yes, yeah. Yes. Have you um you said you, you you presented nice like data showing this generalization across verb types and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, pronouns? I'm wondering if you are thinking about looking at if you were to present it with speech and had different speakers, if you would see this generalization also across uh, different uh, you speakers, mean, or like, if it's you mean whether the task modality may play a role. Like if you had different speakers and would people make oh, this generalization over different exposure? Yeah, um, we used to think think about this idea. Um, so like um, the speaker identity, whether they may influence like people's adaptation, because there is literature about like people adapt to different speaker identities and their speech styles. So I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. I think it should have some influence. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank, you. Um, thank Elaine again.